Have a wonderful time at Sunday school, folks. Bye. Oh, that's fine. It's good. We're not in a hurry. It's a joy to hear the thunder of little feet. And don't they talk about the pitter-pat of little feet? I don't hear much of a pitter-pat going on. Yeah, the boots. It's, sure, that's it. The boots. <laughs> Well, brothers and sisters, this is the first Sunday in Lent. Now, there are a couple things to remember about what Lent is and what it isn't and why we celebrate Lent, but also um, how Lent is not something that we are only supposed to be thinking about, or, or rather the, the realities of Lent, what Lent is all about, is not something we are only supposed to think about during the season of Lent, but rather it is... This is stuff that needs to permeate our whole lives every day, every moment of every day. But during the season of Lent, we are particularly preparing our hearts and minds for the reality of Jesus' uh, suffering and death on the cross on Good Friday and for His resurrection on Easter and for all that that implies and entails for us. Now, this means that for a lot of Christians, and perhaps for some of you, perhaps for many of you or all of you, um, Lent is also a time uh, you do spiritual preparation by often releasing or letting go of or setting aside or fasting from something or some series of things uh, in order to at least give you a bit of a small taste a, a tiny taste of Christ's sacrifice to help you to focus on that sacrifice and to enable you to, to set aside whatever time or space that thing or those things took and, and focus more fully on Jesus during that time. Lent is often a somber time. That is, the, the sort of the Monday to Saturday traditionally in the Christian uh, calendar is a, a fairly somber time. You start, with, you start with Ash Wednesday, which is when we receive the ashes in many traditions on our foreheads, symbolizing the mourning and the grief that is there. Why? Because our Lord and Savior, Jesus, had to suffer and die. Why? Because we were the ones who made that necessary. Why? Because we were the ones who killed Him. And so we grieve. It's like the, the prophets of old tearing their clothes, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But Sundays, Sundays throughout the season of Lent are supposed to be sort of mini Easter's. When we go through the season of Advent, we have Sundays of Advent. That little, that little, uh, what do you call that preposition? Yeah, good. All right, grammar. <laughs> right. That little preposition of is important. Those Sundays in Advent are the times when we are preparing ourselves, well, the whole season of Advent, we're preparing ourselves for the coming of Jesus Christ as a baby, the incarnation uh, that is so significant. Jesus, God with us. A and each of the Sundays of Advent is part of the whole of Advent. But when we talk about Lent, we have Sundays in Lent. And there again, that preposition is important because the Sundays that happen during the season of Lent are not of Lent. They are simply in Lent. And that is because, that is because each Sunday is to be kind of a mini Easter, right? We, we, we are serious and reflective about 
how we ourselves caused it to be necessary for Jesus to die, about how we ourselves are the ones who, who tortured Him and mocked Him and whipped Him and nailed Him to the cross. We ourselves are Pilate. We ourselves are the Jews crying for His crucifixion. We do that throughout the week. And then on Easter, we are reminded that that is not the end. It doesn't end in the darkness of our own disgusting sin. It does not end in the defeat of Jesus. But rather it ends, or rather it begins anew on Easter. When, when sins are forgiven, when death is conquered, when Satan is finally vanquished. And so this Sunday, this first Sunday in Lent, is our first mini-Easter, as it were. And so for our first mini-Easter, we are looking at two passages. We are going to first look at uh, a passage from the book of Luke. We're going to look at Luke chapter 4. And this is where uh, Jesus is tested in the wilderness. The, the Sundays in Lent will often lead us through a really brief snapshot of Jesus' overall ministry and life. And so we're going to start with one of the, the, the thing that happens really just before Jesus' public ministry gets going. So Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 to 13. We read these words. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, where he was baptized by John, uh, and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will, they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And the second passage that we will read this morning is from Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verses 8 to 13, in which we read these words. Actually, I'm going to read a little bit before that just so you get the context. But 8 to, 10, uh, 8 to 13 is what we're focusing on. Moses, Paul the Apostle writes to us, Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. That is, the person who does the law, who fulfills the law, who does the law, will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend to the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? This is the faith, the righteousness that is by faith. But what does it say? 
The Word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scriptures say, anyone who believes in Him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and richly blesses all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of the Lord. Amen. Well, there are a few things that we need to notice here. Now, um, we could spend a lot of time looking specifically at the temptations that Jesus receives and what those mean. And, And that is a rich and wonderful and powerful Bible study and a great sermon, uh, if I made it. That's not the sermon, however, that I made. However, it is important to notice that that Satan is essentially tempting Jesus to do exactly what he tempted Adam and Eve to do. And that is for them to try and wrest control over their own lives and out of God's hands into their own. Right? That is essentially what Satan does with Adam and Eve. He says to them, eat of the tree of life, or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, excuse me, and and you're not going to surely die, at least not right away. You will instead become like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. You will become like God. Right? You will be able to make your own moral, ethical decisions. You will be your own boss. Satan says to Adam and Eve. And of course, they go for it. They go for it. In a similar manner, Jesus is told that <laughs> by Satan that he should just use his own power to make this, this rock into bread. Right? You're, you're the Son of God. Prove it. Give yourself some bread while you're at it. Take control of your own life. But as we've said before, that would, that would be cheating. That would be like God becoming a human being, but then doing what, what we need Him to do, living a righteous life, by pulling out the God card. Right? Oh, you know, it's so easy for Jesus. He's God, after all. But He doesn't. The Bible tells us very clearly that Jesus does everything He does in perfect obedience and submission to the Father. He does only what the Father asks. And He also says to us that we can do greater things. And the only way that's possible is if Jesus did everything He did as a human being. Not that He was no longer divine. He was indeed still divine. But He didn't pull out that power card and use it. Instead, he lived a human life with a human relationship with his Father God. Except that it was perfect. Right? And so, Jesus does not fall to Satan's temptation to pull out the God card and take control giving himself bread. Right? And likewise, You know, Satan, when he says, hey, I'll give you all the power and authority of the whole world if you just worship me. Well, of course, then that is basically God being supplanted by the devil and Jesus taking control of the world just by bowing the knee a little bit. It'll be fine. Then I can make all the people in the world do what is right and good. But of course, Jesus chooses not to do that. And then Satan says, okay, 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 fine. You trust in God so much, prove it. Show me how much you trust in God. Just throw yourself off of the temple. It'll be fine. After all, it is written. 
right? And Jesus says, no, no. That's another way of trying to control God. It's like the passive-aggressive person who says, oh, my day's been so hard, it would be so nice if somebody took out the trash. Right? It would be so nice if, God, you rescued me by sending your angels. Right? That's, we don't control God. Like C.S. Lewis said, he is not a tame God. And so Jesus resists that as well, right? But more importantly, perhaps, than all of that, the thing that ties together all of these is that Jesus, who is the Son of God and the Word of God, capital W, the Word of God, Jesus proclaims with his mouth his belief in God the Father with everything he does. And not only does he proclaim with his mouth, he also proclaims with his deeds. Now his deeds here are basically resisting the deeds that Satan wants him to do, right? Resisting worshiping, resisting uh, making a loaf of bread out of a rock, resisting throwing himself off the temple. But he is acting also, right? Because Jesus proclaims with his, wor- with his words and his actions, proclaims with his mouth his belief in the Father. Which is, of course, also in contrast to what Adam and Eve really did. Because in a way, when they said, ah, yes, I want to take control, they were in a way saying, really, I don't trust you, God. I don't believe you that you have good things for me. At least not the good that I want. And so Jesus with his words and his deeds proclaims his belief, which ties in, of course, you can perhaps see, to our passage from Romans. Right? Paul is talking about Moses saying, first of all, to, to the Jewish people you know, thousands of years ago, saying to them that the person who does the things, who obeys the commandments, who obeys the laws, that person will live by that obedience. In other words, they would be saved by their obedience to the law. Now, of course, Paul outlines a little bit in, in other places numerous times that really any, any idea of actually being able to obey the law is, is fakery and nonsense. You can't do it, right? So the reality is, is that the people who obey the law will not actually live by it, but they will die by it because it becomes a condemnation, right? Especially when we look at the teachings of Jesus, where Jesus unpacks the heart of the law and makes it, uh, makes it really real for us. I tell you, if you are even angry with someone in your heart, then you risk the fires of hell for murder, right? Right? Jesus unpacks that and makes it clear that all of us are guilty. Right? But then Paul says, "Okay, the righteousness by faith does not say who will ascend into heaven in order to go get Jesus. Right? Who's... (laughs) I got an errand for somebody. Hey, uh, Glory, you want to go up and get Jesus for us? (laughs) Just work on that, okay? Right? Or, or Diane, how about you? Why don't you go down into the realm of the dead and just get Jesus for us? Right? No, 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 Paul says. No, that's nonsense. That's crazy talk. Because instead, the faith, the faith, the righteousness that comes from faith is a righteousness that declares Jesus is Lord. Verse 9. If you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and that and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, this is a little bit of a chicken and egg sort of thing, in a way, right? So, 
declaring with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Well, is that... Um, so you say the words and then you're saved or something happens in your heart and uh, you are saved and that's why you say the words. Which comes first? The, the salvation or the words? Well, oh, right? The reality is, is that we need to believe. We need to believe in Jesus and what He offers to us. But the reality is also that the Holy Spirit works in our hearts to soften it up and get us to the point where we can say yes. And we, we believe that no one can stand before God and say, oh, good for me, I picked Jesus. Right? Instead, we, we humbly go, thank you. Thank you. So, but aside from that theological detail of whether, whether or not this happens first or that happens first. The point is, is that your words need to come out of your mouth saying that Jesus is Lord and that you believe in your heart that Jesus is raised from the dead. That Easter has indeed happened. That we're not stuck forever at Good Friday. Because if we were stuck forever at Good Friday, it would not be Good Friday. It would be Bad Friday. It would be the worst Friday. The yuckiest, most terrible, most horrendous Friday that has ever been. But instead, Easter is true. And, and when, Paul talks about, when Paul talks about confessing it with our mouths and believing in our hearts, he's not simply saying that we just say the words, right? We had this thing going on in the, you know, in the 70s, 80s, 90s for a while or whatever. Maybe it's still going on some places. Thankfully, it's not as current as it used to be. But this idea that you could just pray the prayer. Just pray the prayer. And if you just pray the prayer, then you're saved. And it's not, it's not that the prayer is not effective, but it's that there's more to it than that. It's not a one and done thing. You're not like, okay, uh, God, I need my cosmic life insurance policy. Don't know if you actually exist, but in case you do, I'm going to say, I'm sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Uh, from now on. Good? It's not like that. There's a transformation that happens. And so from then on, you, through the transformation, the washing of Jesus' blood, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, through the ongoing work of sanctification, through the body of believers who are strengthening you and challenging you, through the love and compassion that we have for one another, through all of those things, you are growing into the full maturity of Christ who is our head. Which means that your words are not just words, they are also actions. Right? Think about this. I, I want to find a really good metaphor for this. I haven't really gotten it yet. If I ever get a really good one, if you have a great metaphor for this, just please give it to me because I don't have one. But think about this, and this is the best I've come up with. You know in the olden days when they said, or on the movies or whatever, when some, some hero says, my word is my bond. Right? They're saying that the words that they say are so true that they can be relied upon. Right? It's like the deed is already done. I'll rescue your dog, ma'am. Right? You, you know that guy. He's the hero. He can do it. He's going to do it because his word is his bond. And so even though the dog is still in trouble, you believe him. It's like it's already done. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is the expression of all that God is. His Word is so, so true, capital T true, 
that Jesus is the truth, the way, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through, except through Jesus. Jesus is the expression of the Father, of everything. And it's not it's just like He's a pale shadow. It's not even like He's the hero's word. It's so far beyond that, that Jesus is God, and God is Jesus, and they are the three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There is no separation between them except that they are unique persons, except that they are part of one God. And so when, when Jesus gives His Word, it can be relied upon. It is not just as if it has already been done. It has been done. It is done. It's finished. When Jesus says on the cross, it is finished, it's finished. When Jesus says your sins are forgiven, they're, they're forgiven. That's that. When Jesus says go get up and walk, that you do that. Right? He's the Word. Right? And so when Paul speaks here about proclaiming with your mouth, that's the kind of proclamation that he's talking about. He's talking about us using our words as in our actions and our words, our whole being, everything that we are, to proclaim Jesus is Lord. So, when you're making breakfast, you're proclaiming Jesus is Lord. When you're sweeping the floor, you're proclaiming Jesus is Lord. When you're on the street corner and you say Jesus is Lord, you're saying Jesus is Lord. When you're talking to your neighbor and you're loving them compassionately because of the difficulty that they're going through, you're saying Jesus is Lord. When you're writing a computer program, when you're milking your cows, when you're fixing your robot, when you're, when you're, when you're dealing with goats, whatever you're doing, you are saying Jesus is Lord. And when you are doing that, when you are saying that, and when you believe it in your heart, when it is part of all that you are and all that you believe and all that you know, you're golden. You are saved. Right? Now, don't despair. Don't despair. Because Paul is not saying that you are going to be able in this lifetime to do that 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, every moment of the day with every fiber of your being. No, no, no. That will be where you are someday, praise God, when we are raised again in our fully, newly glorified bodies and we see Jesus face to face and all of that is finally over in, in every single way. Yeah, we're going to be there. But in the meantime, we are in that journey. We are growing more every day. And, and sometimes it feels like two steps forward one step back. Sometimes it feels like two steps back, a quarter of a step forward. But that is what has happened. That is what is true about you. So brothers and sisters, on this mini Easter, we are proclaiming together with our songs, with our very presence, with the words that we say, with the way that we treat one another, with the way that we love the world around us, with how we care for God's creation as God called Adam and Eve to right in the beginning. We're saying with all of those things, including the words that we say, we are saying Jesus is Lord. And if you're not there, if you have never been there, if you have never been in the place where you actually believe that, then please come and talk to me. Come and talk to somebody beside you. Because though we may sometimes feel a little bit shy about sharing some of those faith stories, they're there. And they're beautiful. And everybody here wants to talk with you about Jesus. And if you're struggling because you feel like you are in a dry valley and all you can see is the good Friday that feels like a bad Friday, 
it's okay. It's okay not because that's a good place to stay, because, but because everybody's been in that dark place. But Jesus is Lord. And He loves you. And you are welcome if you are broken hearted, if you are crushed in spirit. It's okay. You are loved. And Jesus is Lord. Brothers and sisters, celebrate this mini Easter. And tomorrow when you go back to Lent, don't forget, that Good Friday is not the end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank You so very much for Your Son Jesus who testified through His words and His deeds that You, God, are God. He resisted temptation from the devil with, his, with everything that He had. And He won victory over Satan both in the desert and on the cross and in the grave. And so, Lord, we testify together with Christ followers throughout the world. Jesus is Lord. And Lord, if we are struggling to believe that in our hearts at this moment, please, Lord, please may we say, I believe, Lord, help my unbelief. And would You through Your Spirit. Help us to speak with our words and our deeds, proclaiming this to be true, that You are Lord Jesus. And may we live in the reality of us being saved through You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Brothers and sisters, we will sing as our song of response. We'll sing as our song of response. What a friend we have in Jesus. For that is true, brothers and sisters. Let us sing it aloud as our proclamation once again that Jesus is Lord. Let us stand.